Hello and welcome to episode 46 of the Ask Historians podcast. So today our episode is kind of a focusing in on a topic that we covered last, uh, in the last episode uh, with Chocolate Pod, who, by the way, just to uh, get this right off off the bat, uh, she'll be doing a Ask Me Anything on the main Ask Historians uh, forum uh, on 19th century women's fashion. That'll be uh, Monday, September 28th. So feel free if you have any questions uh, stemming from uh, the podcast episode or any questions on 19th century women's fashion, uh, feel free to go and ask her anything. Uh, but for today, <laughs> we're going to be focusing on, on one topic that we touched on that last episode, which is uh, Le Chemise à la Reine. And my French is terrible, so forgive me, but it, it's the dress that was uh, made popular by Marie Antoinette in a kind of scandalous painting. The dress itself, though, has this kind of very interesting and varied background that our, our guest today, Kitty Dentures, will be covering in, in much more in depth. But uh, it, it basically stems from a Italian painter who was sent to the French West Indies to spy for the English, who instead ended up kind of uh, perving on the local women and painting pictures of them instead of doing what he was supposed to be doing. Uh, and then those pictures of their kind of style of dress went back to France where that style of dress was then picked up on by a disgraced courtesan who was sponsoring a painter who was BFFs with Marie Antoinette, and thus we get Le Chimie Sullivan. So it's an example of kind of this long, convoluted trail of, of fashion and history, and uh, kind of just an example of the, the interconnectedness of the world of that time. We're going to spend about the first uh, maybe half or two-thirds of the podcast on that, and then we're going to pivot from there into talking about historical costumery, essentially uh, how modern media depictions of, uh, well, of media depict the past, uh, particularly in styles of dress and clothing and fashion, uh, and a little bit in kind of, you know, interior design as well. But um, and while that may seem like a bit of an abrupt pivot, uh, it really kind of makes sense in the way that, just consider the fact that this period is very, very often depicted, this kind of Versailles court is often depicted, and you can probably see in your mind's eye what it should look like. But then we have this this one dress and this kind of uh, shift in <laughs> shift. Get it? Um, if you don't, you'll get it by the end of this podcast. But we have this shift in the way that uh, people were dressing at the time, and it, it really goes against this kind of popular notion of these you know these very tight corseted stays, structured dresses with the big hairdos and all things like that uh, into kind of this more naturalistic style, and it really goes against these um, very popular portrayals of history and so this, this moving from this one story of this one dress and kind of looking at the whole holistic history of it into talking about how modern media depicts the past in this very non-holistic and kind of almost slapdash style it, it is not so much of a pivot but really kind of looking at once you examine the whole history of an item you can put it in place within its historical context and that historical context gives it more meaning as opposed to simply treating it like a costume uh, or, or dress up. It, it then becomes a part of the story. So I, I hope you can keep that in mind as we go through uh, and uh, I hope you <laughs> enjoy the podcast today. Uh, it's a really great one. Our guest is a fantastic speaker and just it, it was it was a delight to have her. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. Today I am here with Kitty Dentures, as she's known on the site. However, she goes by a slightly different name in real life. Uh, but why don't I let her introduce herself? So uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us an idea of your background and what got you interested in this topic? Well, my name is Sarah Lorraine um, and I am interested in historical dress. I mean, broadly, very broadly, it's historical dress. More specifically, the clothing and costume of, and I, I make a distinction between the two, um, of the 16th through the 18th century. And even more specifically, I am narrowly focused right now, the bulk of my research is being done on the early 1780s with the chemise à la reine, which was a particular style of dress that was credited as having been originated by Marie Antoinette, but as we've gotten more and more scholarship on it being published, we've learned that there's a, there's quite a history to it that predates her and also postdates her. So that's where my current research is. I know we talked about this, or we didn't talk about this, but the, the previous episode that we've had kind of touched on this dress a little bit, but go ahead and fill us in on what what is this dress? What time period? What's the context? So the Chemise à la Reine 
it, it makes its appearance in the late 1770s in France. It may have existed in parts of the world other than France before it got picked up by Marie Antoinette. It's essentially a chemise. Um, it's right in, the, right in the name. It's a loose-fitting cotton or linen, lightweight muslin shift, basically. It's shapeless. It's, it's literally a rectangle with um, you know, a gathering at the waist and some slightly puffy sleeves. So when this was first introduced in France, um, usually, as I said before, credited as Marie Antoinette introducing it to the court, it was seen as such a radical departure from what the current standards of dress were for not just women in general, but specifically for the Queen of France. Uh, it was incredibly relaxed. It was like wearing, you know, a nightgown. Because you had said that, you know, this is a chemise, this has been around, it's nothing new. Uh, so I mean, was what was the change? Just that it was now, um, I guess you could say, outerwear as opposed to underwear? Yeah, exactly. I think I think it's fair to say that it's probably one of the very first instances of, of underwear as outerwear. Even though it's designed specifically to be an outerwear garment, it's very much based on a uh, on, on the chemise itself, the the very the undergarment that goes underneath all of the clothing before you put on your stays, before you put your gown on. You wear this very simple, very tubular shaped dress or uh, a shirt or shift underneath everything that keeps uh, the dirt away from the dirt of your body away from the fine fabrics of, you know, your corset or your stays and your gown, etc. So this kind of came out of that. Um, there's some early scholarship that was done on it in, I'd say, roughly in the, in the 1960s, uh, when the Manchester Gallery at Platt Hall in Manchester, UK, uh, put their chemise all ren on display. And so this kind of incited a uh, a, a flurry of activity surrounding this particular um, dress that's at Platt Hall. And it was it was conjectured that this was supposed to be a Grecian style, that this was supposed to be the first nod towards the classical Grecian or democratic style of clothing that became more popular in the 19th century or in the, the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, as we've studied the dress more, I personally, my personal philosophy is that it goes completely in a different direction, that this is actually something that came out of the Indies, uh, particularly the island of Martinique um, has, a, has an interesting association with this similar style of garment. And there's been hints that I've been digging up and trying to piece together through you know, the late 18th century all the way through the 19th century of this actually being a style of dress that was brought from Martinique or Saint Domingo, and these, and then, these French colonies out in yeah, out in the French Caribbean. Colonies. Yeah, yeah. So where, were, yeah, were they were they be you know was this style of dress being worn by French settlers there, or was this something that was kind of a, a syncretism with more? Uh, I mean, that area is not exactly known for its dresses and gowns, but I can see it kind of being a syncretism with adopting European fashions into a more indigenous friendly lifestyle. Exactly. Um, it's very, very much on track with that, but it also is, it deviates from that. Uh, it, it possibly, possibly existed as a, a simple sheath dress um, out of, you know, a, a lightweight cotton or a lightweight uh, durable fabric like cotton uh, that would be worn by the Haitian, not just the Haitian set or the French settlers that came in, but the, uh, the Creole population, that it was something that was very much aligned with the Creole and slave, um, also part of the slave trade that existed in that period of time um, in that area. Yeah, because, so, because it is a very simple, simple style. It is, it is. And it's it's interesting to note, the only thing that really that we really have to tie this in is a series of portraits by um, Agostino Brunais. So yeah, we have these, uh, these portraits or paintings that depicted the Creole settlers or the Creole population of, uh, of certain islands done by this Italian painter who was actually employed by the English. Uh, it's kind of an interesting roundabout way that he ended up on these islands painting the so-called native people. And he was particularly fascinated, I think, by Creole fashion and how it was appropriating a lot of upper class or, or wealthy European fashion from the white settlers that were coming in. 
from England and France, but they were also taking it and doing their own thing with it. So one of these things that came about was this very simple white dress. And, and it could have been originally that it was just a simple chemise that, you know, that's all they could afford to wear or that's all they had on hand. And then they just kind of added to it and dressed it up and it became kind of a, a, a style that was very particular to this area. Now, one of the things that I'm doing is trying now to connect that, which is way off the beaten path, to Marie Antoinette, which is not terribly <laughs> difficult, actually. <laughs> yeah, to go, from, to go from the sugar plantations of Haiti exactly. to the courts of Versailles. Yeah. Right. Um, so, well, actually, no, I have a question. So well, what time period was this Italian painter actually in the Caribbean doing these right. paintings? Because we see the, the dress pop up in, like, what, the, the 1780s, I believe, in, right. in paintings in France. Uh, he was operating in the 1760s, 1770s. Much of his uh, paintings are kind of early 1770s. So they do predate the Chemise à la Reine in its um, kind of final incarnation. There's been some um, hints in the historical record that there were a group of Creole women that were presented to Marie Antoinette in the 1770s. I'm having a hard time actually pinning it down. It was a, it was, it was something that was published in the 19th century. So, you know, take it with a massive grain of salt, but, you know, actually trying to figure out if that would have happened, if this would have come through either her exposure directly to Creole women that were perhaps presented to her as part of the look at your bountiful lands and the exotic people that inhabit them <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or well, these these paintings would have gone back to uh, to, to Europe I mean he, he was commissioned by English he was commissioned something by someone in England um, yes. but yeah. presumably it would uh, Marie Antoinette have been able to see these or people in France uh, anyway been able to see these paintings it was yeah I, I hedge on that one I don't really know necessarily I mean they seem to have been pre- kind of painted, uh, Bruneus was painting them essentially for himself because he was actually not sent there to paint these people. He was really sent there to more as a document, you know, to document the uh, the plantations for the English. <laughs> so the English governor brought him over and- So he was there as a spy is what you're saying. Essentially, well, he was there as kind of a, a you know, think of it as as though we take a surveyor now to go out and photograph the the area to get the lay of the land and understand what's going on in it and send it back to headquarters well he was he was tasked to do something similar with the painting but he got really really sidetracked by these you know beautiful exotic people that he was he, he was very taken with especially the women so <laughs> so he spent a lot of time painting these uh painting these women um in various different of uh, various different social hierarchies and uh, and whether or not Marie Antoinette would have ever seen it, have seen any of that, I I really doubt it. Um, I think her exposure came through either directly um, seeing it, you know, like I said, as somebody who uh, a group would have been presented to her in some sort of official capacity, or probably more likely, it was one of her courtiers or one of the people in her circle who had exposure to these, brought the dress in, made it fashionable. Marie Antoinette picks it up. And it becomes named after Marie Antoinette. This is this is one of the questions I had. Was I, I think most of the, the you know research that I've done on this is kind of portrays Marie Antoinette as the one who made this popular. But was she the first one? You know, because it, it sounds like she was the one who it was introduced to her and she popularized it. But she was not the first adopter of this. That that even she might have been kind of picking up from someone else. Yeah, the, there's a. Uh... If you look at the portraiture that was being produced in the 1780s, like very early 1780s, that depict this chemise style dress, uh, there is one portrait that actually predates Marie Antoinette's 1783 portrait by Elizabeth Vigie Le Brun, that one that caused the huge scandal. Uh, I know that Chocolate Pot talked a little bit about it um, in the previous episode, that it needed to be repainted, caused such a big scandal. But there was one portrait that does actually predate that. It's about seven, 1780, and it's of the um, Madame du Berry, who, of course, is this notorious courtesan. <laughs> she was the uh, the the final maîtresse en, t- maîtresse en titre. I'm probably butchering that. I'm, the, no, uh, I'm no better at French, so you can't <laughs> turn to me for help. The chief mistress of uh, of Louis the Fifteenth. Um, so when Louis XV died and he subsequently leaves the throne to his grandson, Louis XVI, who is Marie Antoinette's husband, Madame du Berry was very much kind of still a part of that, that milieu in, in Versailles initially for the first few years, uh, before she was 
she was kind of shunted off a little bit, but she kind of came back and she had she had some influence and some uh, interaction with Versailles. It's not at all like the Sofia Coppola version of Marie Antoinette where she's just kicked out and, you know, never seen again. So she manages to, to more or less try to ingratiate herself back in with Marie Antoinette in, in probably the late 1770s. And I think she has a marginal success with it. She actually is able to kind of work her way back into general favor with the court. One of these things that she did is she was a patroness of Elizabeth Vigier Le Brun. She was one of the earlier patronesses of Vigier Le Brun before Marie Antoinette found out about her. Go ahead and explain uh, who this is, person she is a patron to is. Yeah, so Vichy Le Brun, um, Elizabeth Vichy Le Brun, she was a paintress, <laughs> as they like to call her. Uh, she was a, a painter um, operating in the late 1770s, all the way through to the very early years of the 19th century. Uh, she was one of the few women who was admitted into the academy and she had there were a number of other female painters that were also operating in france and also england uh, around the same time but she was kind of the one who was marie antoinette's favorite she was really part of the trianon crowd as i like to call them <laughs> she was there uh from very early 1780s um maybe even late 1770s she was once she was introduced to marie antoinette marie antoinette just grabbed her and ran with her basically sucked her up and said just paint everything, you know. So she churned out these paintings for Marie Antoinette depicting her, you know, the queen, the queen's family, the children of the queen, and then also the the other women that surrounded the queen as well. So she was so, a, she was she was Marie Antoinette's like artist friend, I guess you could say. Yeah. I mean, she I hesitate to call her an official painter, um, a court painter, official painter, because she really had more or less an unofficial um, role within Marie Antoinette's circle. It was not necessarily an official post that she was appointed to. Uh, she just was there because she, Marie Antoinette liked her and they were friends. And so, uh, and also that she was trendy. She was very much of the, of the time, um, a very trendy individual that people wanted to get to know and seen with, be painted by. Yeah. Well, so, it, it sounds like this, this kind of informal role was actually beneficial because I mean, if, if this dress was kind of so, you know, so new and as we, you know, as we see, it's so scandalous that if there was an, an official painter or painteress, uh, then this painting might not have ever happened. Yeah. And it's that's another interesting little deviation with why the chemise all around touches on all these different women that are well known from this period. Uh, Vigie Le Brun, Marie Antoinette, the Madame du Barry. Even in England, we have the Duchess of Devonshire. We have Mary Robinson, the famous actress. These are all women that were known to have worn this dress and made this dress really kind of a, a staple of their wardrobe in the 1780s. Marie Antoinette is sort of the nexus, or you know, from which everything else kind of comes out of. But I think there's a there's really important distinction to be made. We give Marie Antoinette a lot of credit for creating these outrage, outrageous fashions. She really wasn't a fashion innovator. She was more of an early adopter. She would see these things that would come through her by kind of her style makers, um, her modistes, such as uh, Rose Bertin, who was basically the most famous dressmaker in Europe at, the, at that point in time. She really didn't make dresses. She just decorated them. <laughs> that was really more her her thing. Um, but she had such you know astoundingly good taste that when Marie Antoinette picked her up, it was, you know, whatever Rose Bertin said looked fabulous, then obviously it was okay. And and so she relied on other people to be the uh, the tastemakers, essentially. She was the one who just sort of said, well, if you say so, and you tell me I look fabulous in this, well, then I must look fabulous. And well, that does actually kind of answer <laughs> the other question I had was that, you know, how, how fashion forward was Marie Antoinette? And it sounds like she may not have been, you know, the designer, but she was definitely, she was the one who you, who was wearing you on the red carpet, I guess you could say, if yeah. you were a designer. But I mean, yeah. how fashion forward was the court at this time? Was it expected that you would see these early new fashions popping up in the court of uh, Marie Antoinette and, and uh, in Versailles as well? Well, yeah, there's a distinction. We have to make kind of a clear distinction. The court of Marie Antoinette was really based around the Petit Trianon, and it was a really small, quote unquote, court that really just it was really just her best friends um, and a couple of other lucky people that got invited every so often. You know, the king actually had to ask for permission before he, she, he could enter the grounds. <laughs> you know, anything that was, uh, any proclamations that were issued from the Trianon were issued 
strictly uh, Marie Antoinette. The king didn't have to co-sign. It was really she. It was her own little universe, um, and she she formed the Trianon quote unquote court out of a desire to get away from Versailles, where things were so rigid, and that was really the problem that she had with Versailles culture from the very start, from the moment she first set foot on French soil as a little 15-year-old teenager from Austria, um, was that she was raised in a very relaxed atmosphere, believe it or not, in Austria. And not what most people associate with Austria, yes. Yeah, well, you know, back then it was it was a completely it was the Holy Roman Emperor Empire, basically. Um, and she uh, she came from this this vast family. I think she was about the second or third youngest in in this giant family of multiple um, siblings. And you know, the, her mother was uh, was just this force to be reckoned with. Um, and she kind of got away with just sort of floating under the radar for a while. In fact, they, uh, a lot of the complaints about when the marriage treaty with France was first first brought up was that Marie Antoinette was too unrefined. <laughs> you know, she was too casual. So to, to just jump ahead, she, she is brought up to speed on what it takes to be part of Versailles culture, which is really different than French culture. It's different from Parisian culture. It's different from anything else. Versailles is its own little universe. It, it's court culture, and it's yeah. just a little bubble of court culture. Yeah. It's, it's Versailles. There's no place else on, on the planet that is like it. And it is so steeped in these traditions and these roles that, God forbid, you step one little hair out of line. So Marie Antoinette just kind of comes in and she's she's really you know strangled by all of these strictures. Uh, and, and in a lot of ways, um, you know, attempted to do some rebellion and it didn't really work out for her. So finally, she, she basically gets this escape route. She gets, uh, the king gets her the Petit Trianon, and she is able to have this decompression unit area <laughs> where she can go and she can be herself. And she actually writes at one point that uh, in one of her letters that Trianon is where she can be who she is. She's, I'm myself here. Whereas at Versailles, she's she's the queen of France. And if she, she doesn't act like how Versailles expects the queen of France to act, she gets just annihilated um, socially, essentially. And so there was always this, that was the fundamental underlying issue with, with why she became so unpopular was that she really, really... She was the, distant distant from the people and distant from the yeah, court. Yeah. I, I think she wanted to be, I, the, more, the more I know about her, the more I learn about her, I think she wanted to be warm. I mean, she wanted, she had a kind of fundamentally warm personality that was, was very accepting, but the Versailles culture was the complete opposite of that. And they wanted their queens to be almost nun-like, you know, they, they just, they dress in black, they wear, you know, they, they don't do anything um, out of the ordinary, they maybe dance a little bit, but mostly they just sit there and they watch and, you know, take very much the side, uh, stuck in the sidelines, and the only thing they really care about is whether or not they produce heirs. So that was the other layer of issue, was that her and, and Louis didn't have any, any children until, you know, almost 10 years after, um, after they'd been married, and there's all sorts of speculation as to why that was, but um, if they had had, you know, if they had had an heir early on, it would have yeah. been maybe she had had a little more leeway. Maybe, maybe she you know, you've might. Done, you've have. done your job. Good. You can you can yeah. hang out and do whatever you want. I think that's the standard worldview. I mean, that's certainly mm -hmm. the way it's uh, it's depicted in in the film Marie Antoinette. Most most adaptations of the Marie Antoinette history uh, very much do get this. You get this strong sense that as soon as she has her first baby, which is actually a girl, the pressure is relieved a little bit because number one, she's proven that she's fertile, that she can have children. And and the next baby is actually a boy. And so now she's produced the, you know, that air that everybody was so desperate to have. And that's when she gets a little bit more freedom socially. So let's, let's talk about the, the dress and the scandal or the painting and the scandal. And I guess you could say, yeah. so, I mean, was this, when the painting was this, this, uh, this one particular painting of Marie Antoinette in this particular chemise style dress, uh, it came out and it was a scandal, but I mean, was the scandal I'm asking now, was the scandal more of the people of Versailles or was it the people outside of Versailles who were scandalized by this? It, you know, actually, I would say it's the people outside of Versailles that first kind of the, the rumblings of great, you know, Paris society um, did not react well to to the painting. Uh, so we're still talking know, like upper upper class elite. Upper classes, nobility yeah, but, but there's still that distinction between like, are you actually are you actually at Versailles? Because, I mean, 
if you were one of the courtiers who was, you know, considered kind of the, on the inside at Versailles, you had a huge amount of power, but there were a lot of other courtiers, a lot of other wealthy individuals who kind of came and went um, through Versailles, but their sphere of influence was really more out in Paris itself. And, and I think it was that kind of the, the, the literati, you know, the, the, the cognoscenti, of course I butchered that, um, but the people who, who consider themselves in the know, uh, who think that they're up to date on, on all the trendy and, and uh, interesting things of the time. And they, of course, they go to the academy to see that year's crop of paintings that are being displayed. And, uh, and Marie Antoinette's portrait by, um, Vichy Le Brun is one of those paintings. Um, she had a num- Vichy Le Brun actually had a number of other paintings that she displayed along with that one. This is probably pure speculation, but was there any idea uh, on on both uh, Vichy Le Brun and uh, Antoinette that this would be quite the, this one painting would be quite the scandal? I think I think on Marie Antoinette's end of things, I don't think she thought that deeply about it. But I think on Vichy Le Brun's side of things. Her memoirs, she kind of gives a little bit of a hint that she knew she was provoking, that she knew this was going to be a provocative thing. I don't know if she expected the backlash to be quite as bad as it was, but I think she knew that there was a, a little bit of, um, you know, the stepping out of line with having this very informal portrait of the queen uh, that didn't have any of the queenly aspects to it, you know, like the crown or the, the long cape with the fleur-de-lis or the scepter and or the bust of Louis the 16th gazing down, you know, approvingly of her. Uh, it lacked all of it. Yeah, it painting was her just as, just as a woman. And she was, she was wearing a straw hat. She, was, she had a flower in her hand. She looked very much like your, you know, whatever your concept of the Rousseauian ideal yeah, woman. She, you know? <laughs> she, just, she just rolled in from the fields. Exactly, casually, you know, with the chickens and the lambs and, and all that. But, uh, but she did title it um, The Queen en Chemise. And so she did identify the sitter as the queen. She didn't pull the whole Madam X, you know, anonymous sitter, controversial portrait. But she did what that sergeant did a uh, hundred years later. But she did, um, she did I'd actually definitely identify it as a portrait of the queen. And that, I think, was where they ran into a lot of problems. I, I kind of wonder, and I speculate a little bit about this in my thesis, that if she had not named her as the queen, you know, had, had she been an anonymous, a Madam X kind of a, an individual that was not named, would it have caused as much of an issue? Okay, so I'm going to play the the ignorant of art history here, but wouldn't people recognize the portrait? Yes, um, there's probably a good chance that they would, but it's different in the sense that it's not meant to be a representation of the queen. It's meant to be, you know, an allegorical um, representation, and you see that a lot. You know, you you always see queens and and other powerful women allegorically rep- having themselves represented as you know, peace and prosperity or Diana or, you know, things like that in, in very scantily kind of scandalous clothing. But there's two things there. Number one, they're not saying this is a portrait of the queen. And number two, they're really not displaying it in public. This is really kind of for, you know, special people's viewing privileges only. And so when they, this, this portrait, which is so very, very you know, banal, actually, <laughs> the white dress, it's nothing special. And you look at it, you're like, oh, what a nice portrait of a lady. But it lacks all of the queen, queenly distinction that that was very, very much engraved in, in tradition um, about what a portrait of a queen should be. So I think that that was where they ran into this massive backlash. And ultimately, Vigée Le Brun did have to repaint um, the portrait in a more appropriate dress, uh, a silk gown, and you know her hair coiffed and and covered with a you know a, a fancy little bonnet and <laughs> and all you know all these other little subtle changes that then made it acceptable <laughs> versus this chemise gown, which apparently was like you know walking out in your underwear and what's up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> underwear is outerwear. But I actually yeah. I have a bit of a, a technical question then because uh, I you know I've seen prints and reproductions in, in my background re- research for this and yeah it, it looks of this of this painting presumably after it's been retouched and reworked to be more modest. But has anyone attempted to maybe do any kind of uh, imaging techniques or to see what the painting would look like below the retouching? No, no one's actually done that. So so there's actually two separate paintings. There's the, the original, in fact, there's actually a, a couple of copies of the quote-unquote original uh, Queen 
Alain Chimay's um, dress that Vigie Le Brun did. One is in the, um, the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., and another is in a private collection somewhere in the universe, <laughs> you know, one of those locked away. For it's, a, it's, it's lost in the dark, dark yeah. universe of private it's collections. Not, so as far as I know, the only, the only Vichy Le Brun copy that is actually out there of this particular painting is the one that's in DC. And then there's the other painting, the, the second painting that was produced that was re, reworked her in the blue silk gown with the rose. Um, it's the uh, queen with a rose, I think is what it's titled. Um, and that there, there's never been any sort of X-rays that have been done on these, and I think because it, it's really a straightforward portrait, I don't think I don't think Vigie Le Brun really attempted to cover anything up. Um, she painted what she saw and what she ideally um, she thought was the ideal beauty. <laughs> so, so, so it wasn't that the original painting was painting, painted over; it's that another painting itself was done. Exactly. When when we talk about it being redone, we really mean that it was not so much painted over; it was it was a whole separate painting was created. Um, and then displayed in lieu of the the controversial painting. Gotcha. It was so, take yes. this down, put it in a dark corner, put up something yeah. appropriate. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, Marie Antoinette actually had a, a history of sending portraits similar to this to people that she was particularly close to. I mean, she sent portraits to her mother that were considered, you know, would be considered scandalous. Uh, there's one very early on um, in her time in France where she's painted astride a horse in the manner of... Uh, of Louis the Sun King, you know, the just she's wearing men's clothing and she sent it to her mother and her mother thought that, okay, that's a lovely portrait of you. But it's not like she was hanging it up for all the world to see that there's the queen or the, at that point, the, the Dauphin, you know, wearing men's clothing, <laughs> stride a horse. <laughs> that probably would have thought this, this is, Yeah, not meant to be an official portrait. No, no. So yeah, there's there's definitely all of this uh, this idea of official, unofficial, public, private, and, and where these things were appropriate to be um, to be displayed. And and I think Vichy Le Brun, like I said a, a minute ago, I think she really did expect to cause a, a kerfluffle because she knew that this stuff was not a traditional portrait of the queen, and yet she put it forward and identified it as a portrait of the queen. And if you're at all into art history and you know anything about you know the various and sundry rules of how to do a you know pull off a court portrait it it really basically breaks all of those rules it, it doesn't follow any of those rules <laughs> so um so yeah i think i think she was pretty much she knew what she was doing i don't think i don't think rand when had a clue though uh, so <laughs> I, she was up in her own little universe she was she was uh you know frolicking in the fields out at Le Mo, her Mo. Or mole. I can never pronounce it. Yeah. This, but, you uh, know, she, her idea was like, this is the new style. Excellent. I'll wear the yeah. new style and you paint me. Yeah. It. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and so she didn't, I, like I said, I don't think she thought that critically about what was going to happen. And not only that, I don't think she was at all prepared for the backlash that continued in the wake of that portrait. Once it was kind of put out there that this is what the queen wears, this is the uniform at Trianon that, you know, all the queen's ladies, then there'd already been a lot of, um, you know, pornographic, uh, scandalous libels that were being published at that point that were uh, attacking the queen and saying that she was having lesbian relationships with her ladies in waiting and, you know, various affairs with various gentlemen of, of all types, high and low. And it took on this whole new <laughs> kind of appearance um, when shortly after that portrait was painted in 1783 and caused the scandal in uh, 1785 was the the, um, the affair of the necklace this was another interesting side tan you know kind of side story of the chemise gown in that it did become so closely identified with marie antoinette perhaps because of Vichy Le Brun's portrait that when the scammers who were trying to scam money out of uh, Cardinal Rowan wanted to set him up with the queen because he desperately wanted to talk to her because she had cut him out of his lot out of her life a uh, number of years before. Yeah, and, and uh, just, just to interject, they, but the the affair of the necklace is this yeah. uh, this fake okay. necklace that was trying to attempt to be. It this, yeah. It wasn't fake. It was actually it was a wildly expensive diamond necklace that had been I think it would have been produced for um, Madame du Barry, and uh, and but it was so expensive that that Louis the 15th couldn't pay for it at the time, couldn't justify paying for it. So it basically bankrupted this guy, um, the, the jeweler who, who made it until, you know, a couple of, um, a couple of scam artists happened along and created this idea that 
you know, they can get some gullible noble to put the money up to buy the necklace for the queen, essentially. And Rohan was kind of the, the gullible idiot who was who was totally primed and ready to fall into this uh, the scam. So when when it came down to having to meet the queen, Rowan demanded that he needed to meet the queen in person. They set up, they got a prostitute from Paris and put her, you know, she looked vaguely like the queen. They put her in a chemise gown and they trotted her out in this, you know, dark um, nighttime park assignation <laughs> and uh, to meet Rowan. And he fell for it hook, line and sinker. He bought the necklace. He gave it, turned it over to the scam artists. They, of course, ran with it immediately and broke it up and sold the diamonds and made a ridiculous amount of money. And what happened was when this all came out, um, even though Marie Antoinette had nothing to do with this, had absolutely nothing to do with it. Her, her name got attached to it. Yeah, her likeness had been misappropriated or uh, had been appropriated for this nefarious deed that was going to happen. It definitely was one of those very um, potent uh, backlashes of, of French, uh, French society directly aimed at the queen. Uh, they they pardoned Count, uh, the Cardinal Rowan, but basically the libels got even worse and the, uh, the public. <laughs> and and I, I think most of us know how this ends. Yeah, and, 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 yeah exactly. Like six, seven years later, she's got her head chopped off. But uh, but it, it's, it is important and very interesting to, to really, um, I can't stress it enough that the chemise à la reine was integral to this entire plan. It was such a, a deeply uniform or deeply held um, association with the queen at this point that all of these these libels and uh, and rumors or you know, things that were going around at this time uh, really focus on that as kind of what she always was wearing, you know, that, that she always wore these. these uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I can see I can see the deal going down in this, you know, this nighttime deal, and this this woman who looks vaguely like the queen shows yeah. up in the dress, and you know, the cardinal's like, I'm not really sure, and she's like, I'm wearing the dress. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, apparently, Cardinal Rowan just completely bought into it. He was so desperate to get in with the queen to ingratiate himself with her that, and he hadn't he hadn't really seen her um in a number of years so apparently it was fairly easy to fool him and he just bought it and ran with it um until it came out that he'd been <laughs> so let's so let's let's talk about the the physical physical aspects of the dress itself then uh, since at this point if we keep going further we're we literally yeah. are going to end up talking about what marie antoinette was wearing when she was beheaded um yeah. which is <laughs> an interesting uh, probably an interesting topic in and of itself but let's say yeah. maybe a little focused so what was, uh, I mean, are there, are there physical remnants, artifacts remaining? Are there extant dresses or even dresses that are directly linked to Marie Antoinette that are still left in this uh, style? Actually, very, very few dresses exist that have a direct um, association, a provenance of Marie Antoinette. Uh, there's one in a museum in Toronto that they speculate has, has very good likelihood of being uh, one of Marie Antoinette's gowns. But other than that, it's just a lot of kind of specious claims. Like you know, there's a shoe somewhere in some collection that's allegedly Marie Antoinette's shoe, but you can't really prove it because the provenance is, you know, nothing at this point. Nobody's really bothered to pin it down. Um, so, so actually finding anything that was really hers um, is is really really hard. A lot of it was destroyed in the revolution. You know, things that that weren't destroyed probably were locked away in in someone's attic for decades and forgotten about and then by the time that you know it came time to go through grandma's stuff they find this dress that's basically in, in tatters <laughs> so so not a lot of things were actually actively preserved from uh, Marie Antoinette's personal clothing collection so to to tie into the chemise à la reine there is actually one extant chemise à la reine that dates from the 17, 1780 to 1785 I personally feel it's it's actually closer to like 1783, 1784. It's in the Manchester Gallery collection, and uh, and that one, we don't know the provenance for that at all. Frustratingly. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but, but how is it, I mean, how, I mean, this is a very simple dress, but assumingly this was a dress made, you know, a very simple dress made for a very fancy woman. Um, even this one that's not directly linked to Marie Antoinette. 
So do we see, you know, the use of particularly high class, you know, high, high value, fa- uh, high value, sorry, um, um, fabrics or very, uh, very, very fancy stitching or anything to kind of gussy this up to be more than just, a, you know, plain basic chemise? Uh, actually, yes. And this is the interesting thing, even though it was just a, you know, a tube of fabric that was gathered around the waist, uh, it essentially had, was made of incredibly fine fabric. And of course, one of the, if we go back to Marie Antoinette again and, and her unpopularity, one of the scandals that she caused with this dress, uh, she managed to piss off the entire silk industry in Lyon because the dress that she was so, so fond of, the chemise gown, was made of cotton. So <laughs> she was blamed for single-handedly undermining the uh, silk industry in Lyon, rightly or wrongly, it doesn't really matter, but they were outraged enough that they complained and uh, and she ended up having to wear a more silk and order more silk in order to... <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about it, that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's ridiculous. A lot of this is really funny. But uh, but yeah, they typically were made out of, out of this expensive cotton. Uh, we don't really think of cotton as being an expensive fabric these days. But if you try to find a very, very sheer, lightweight cotton, it can run you, it can run you a pretty penny. And in that time, that cotton would have been produced probably in India, maybe even in the Levant. But it was... The, the raw cotton is produced in India. No, they, the actual textile would mm-hmm. have been produced. Excellent. And then brought in um, into France. And so... So there's there was a lot of you know commerce wrapped up in in the fabric itself. Eventually, though, it, it went from being a simple cotton frock to being a more elaborate. As, as it went deeper and deeper into the 1780s, you see the fashion plates get more and more elaborate with these chemise gowns, and they're usually referred to as a. Oh, the, I'm sorry. Also, I should mention too that the alternate name is a gall, which has confused historians for a while about whether it's referring to. Uh, native French dress, the Gaulish dress, which isn't spelled that way. It's G-A-U-L-L-E. Uh, Gaul is in Gallic, as in yeah, French. It, yeah, well, exactly, as in, as in French, but it's really not. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. And, yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Um, the Gaul, I think, is actually, this is, again, where that, that comes back to the uh, the Caribbean, the Caribbean, what is the... Um, there is a word in in Creole, um, that particular type of Creole that's spoken in Martinique, that is G O L, and it essentially means like a sack. So you kind of have to wonder, maybe that was a holdover. That was something that was brought over um, with the dress when it leapt from the Caribbean into France or into Europe. But it, these dresses were often in the. To go back to your question about how elaborate they got, um, they were often referred to as a chemise a la somebody. So you had not just the chemise a la reine, you had the chemise a la Guimard, and Madame Guimard was a famous ballerina at the time. You had the chemise, the one that I, I find is hysterical and I can't make head nor tails about why it's called this, the chemise a la Jesus. <laughs> what, about it means, what, it, what does it have? Like you look at this fashion plate and, and you really have to rack your brain as to why this thing would be called the chemise a la Jesus because it has nothing to do with anything you would think Jesus would have worn or association. Maybe, uh, maybe it has an opening in the side for the spear. I guess. I mean, it, it's it's striped. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah, the, the fabrics start to get a little bit more elaborate, but they start to add more trimming to it. You end up with ribbons being attached to it and rosettes and embroideries and yeah. all sorts of so who who would have been who would have been actually making these and like how long would it, how long would a dress like this take to make? Well, it took me when I did my um, my very basic one that I made uh, based on the Manchester Gallery chemise. It took me about and I hand sewed it a couple of days of work. It's not a very elaborate dress, and if you're a relatively quick sewer like I am, um, you can bust it out pretty quickly. And and that's another thing that you know we have to keep in mind too is that. These dresses could be produced in house. You know, this could be something that a woman could ostensibly make herself. So you're cutting out a large number of commerce again with the uh, you know, the, the modistes and the fashion, um, the clothing makers in in Europe. You know, they're no longer people are no longer or not so much no longer because they still go to these people to have the fancier dresses made, the more important. Um, dresses made. And if you're the queen and you're rich or you're a powerful person, you're always going to go to somebody and have your dresses made. You probably never make your own dress. But I think it, it was it was a more accessible style for the lower classes to, to get their hands on and run with it as well. 
Um, and they, of course, would have made it themselves. And it, yeah, so I, it, it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot of fabric and it doesn't take a lot of time to make. Yeah, so you had mentioned uh, that you had made your own dress, and which kind of makes me want to segue to uh, kind of a second part here that we're, we're going to be talking about. You are a, um, I, I think, a costumer, I guess you could say, or a, a recreationist. I don't. You do you create these things. You don't just study these historical dresses and historical clothing. You create them. So I don't know what the exact right term is, but I consider myself a historical costumer. That's that's what I call myself. Uh, and I think that in the in the costuming community and also in the histori- history community, historian community, it, there is a distinction between um, a historian who studies clothing and a costumer or <laughs> a costumer who makes historical dress. And I find that that there's a, a kind of a blindness on both sides. And so what I really wanted to do, and I was always interested in doing, was to kind of merge the two and to get as much information as of, out of the history as I possibly could, and then also apply it in um, in real tangible terms to see what happened, you know, how, how these things were done. Um, of course, you know, that's the, the term experimental archaeology. Some people find it, you know, eye rolling. I actually like it. I think it's a really good description of how, uh, you know, how we approach this. Historical costumers tend to approach a piece, and there's a, a whole bunch of research that goes into, you know, before you even touch the fabric, before you even create the garment, you're you're doing the research in the background, and it's oftentimes it's touching on, you know, social issues, on on uh, religious issues, on laws, on pornography, you know, anything and everything you can you're pulling in in order to understand this this particular garment, and then when you make it, you can kind of understand what it meant to be wearing it or what it meant to make the item. And and I think it just, it brings it that much closer. And that's why I always was attracted to history. And that's why I always wanted to be part of it <laughs> was that feeling of wanting to get to know the past and wanting to be chummy with the past and really, and, and that also led me into reenactment. I, I've done numerous types of reenactment from middle ages to 19th and 20th century, um, 1920s uh, reenactment. And it's it's been something that I do as a hobby, but it definitely informs my my academic life as well. Yeah, well, let's 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 roll let's roll back a little bit because I do like the idea of thinking of this as experimental archaeology. Although my personal experience with that is more like flint napping. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> <So> <laughs> flint napping on time team. That's <laughs> yeah, which is slightly different from dressmaking. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I, I yeah, and you're right. That is typically the general uh idea of of what the experimental archaeologist is doing is <laughs> sitting in a pile of dirt chipping away at a rock <laughs> yeah, but, but you know we, we have you know numerous and yeah. numerous examples of these rocks and we can chip away at them and say okay you know these flakes look like they match what we're looking for these flakes don't you know whatever whatever but when you just have something like you know one or two extant copies of the artifact you're trying to recreate i mean what what kind of is the what's the research process like going into that well, that's where you kind of have to, to dig into the, the academic side of things. And, you know, not not everyone who tackles a his, historical costume is going to be interested in getting into the, the in-depth academ- academia side of things. It intimidates uh, a lot of people. It intimidates me. <laughs> I'm still intimidated. Uh, but you uh, you would go in and you would really just start researching the the, the world it existed in at that particular time period. For the chemise all around, it was popular during the uh, 1780s, which was a huge time of change in France and also in England. Um, it was taken up by women. It was an issue maybe then of, uh, of gender and sexuality, a type maybe even an early version of women's liberation because it was a much more freeing garment to wear. You still wore a pair of stays with it, but they weren't as you know tight and constricting as, as the court uh, court gowns are required. So you could move around more freely. And so what those issues would have brought up in, in terms of how that would dress would have been worn, how that dress would have been perceived, how it would have been constructed, what it was constructed by, where would they have gotten the fabric? How would the fabric have gotten to them? You know, <laughs> there's all these myriad things, uh, you know, factors that you've got to... You've got so to so there's like an authenticity of spirit as well as an authenticity of actual physical materials as well. 
Exactly. I probably couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> you, you're welcome to steal that and quote it as much as you want. I'm going uh, to put that in there. <laughs> but to go, yeah, but to go, to go to the authenticity of materials to the to the hard stuff. When you're trying to recreate these 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 historical clothing, uh, recreating these, how hard is it to really find authentic materials that they would be working with at the time? You know, it's one thing to go out and find a you know, a flint core and chip away with it. It's another to go out and find um, the equivalent of Indian uh, cotton shipped from, you know, India, the Indian subcontinent to France in the late 18th century. Yeah, it's, if you're trying to get as historically accurate as humanly possible, you're you're never going to get 100%. There's a lot of people that go, or some people, I should say, that go to extreme lengths in trying to uh, commission fabrics to be made in, in as historically accurate way as possible from you know the the type of sheep that the wool would have been cut from um, to manufacturing it uh, weaving it on historical looms and, and in the environment in which it would have originally been in but you've got to just at, at the bottom um, I really think the, the bottom line is is acknowledge that you're a 21st century person and you're never going to get all the way. 100% accurate because, you know, there's isotropic changes in the atmosphere, Why, right? You know, it's not going to be the same sort of cotton that was grown in, in the 1780s in India as you're going to get today. You can get similar fabrics, and that's usually where I, I go, is I try to find something as similar as possible. Also, budgetary concerns. I mean, I could spend a fortune getting, you know, fabrics custom made. Um, there are a few companies, one in Europe in particular, that that do reproduce historical costume or historical fabrics but they're insanely expensive <laughs> we're talking thousands of dollars per per meter so i look at maybe i'll try the uh you know, the closest thing i can get which is a silk damask from a particular uh upholster um upholstery company so it looks similar it's not going to be exactly right it may be woven on a mechanical loom it may be you know not cotton or not silk it would have maybe be uh you know polyester even but you try to find things that are similar enough that you are able to experience it as close as you possibly can and anyone who really tries to get 100 percent accurate is just going to drive themselves crazy i know i did <laughs> so, I well, I, yeah and i suppose there also must be the the issue not just of the raw materials but also of the technique use because it's not like i mean assume in some cases you know we do have historical patterns that are still left over that you can actually look at and say oh this is how they did that but I assume, it particularly is the further back you go, the the more you get kind of like this was sewn by one person uh, or by a couple people who were sewing in a particularly fashion, you know, a particular style that was predominant at the time, and maybe the technique that they used has been lost or been altered or just seems incomprehensible. When you look at it. Oh yeah, a lot of that. Oh, there is a lot of that that's uh, factors um, that is factor in this. But one of the the great things about the the time that we live in right now is not only has the internet brought us all very much closer and there is a huge, huge, very supportive historical costuming community out there, which is of course how I came across Chocolate Pot many years ago. <laughs> and uh, and she, same with me. And the wealth of information that can now be shared online is, is huge, huge. Um, a lot of museums, in fact, I would say most museums out there are, are moving towards, if not already putting up all of their collections with high high res detailed photographs of costumes in their collection there's the williamsburg colonial williamsburg is just a wealth of information on the practicalities of how these garments were sewn and worn their millinery shop which is headed by uh, jenea whitaker is you know probably bar none the closest authentic 18th century clothing reproduction you're going to get and they put these things online. They hold classes. You can go and you can spend a weekend at Williamsburg and learn how to make a shoe. You know, it's the way they did it in 1780. <laughs> so, I mean, so, do, do you have particular styles that you gravitate or to, uh, gravitate towards that you just haven't quite been able to master? Like you're saying, like, oh, I really wish I could make this, but I have no idea. Oh God, I suck at embroidery. That's really the problem. <laughs> A lot of embroidery, a lot of hand embroidery went into uh, into embellishment on on clothing um, prior to the advent of the sewing machine and then the embroidery machine. So uh, so yeah, that's my my one hiccup in my 
my little master plan here. <laughs> well, in, in, in a way that but, reflects back yeah. on what you were saying about yeah. having to learn the the place of these clothing in the, the historical social context as well, because if there was, presumably you don't do much embroidery on your own clothes nowadays. No. Um, no. <laughs> because no. I don't think anyone does a lot of embroidery on their clothes nowadays. So just right. that itself is kind of, <laughs> it's a finding, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah, there's there are uh, there are people out there that still like to embroider their own stuff and, and are great at it. But uh, but I look at myself. I'm a macro costumer. I'm not a micro. You know, I, I don't work in small bits. I work in big bits. And uh, so there there's God, there are numerous parts of costume history on a whole that I do find intimidating. And I think probably the number one era that intimidates me is Edwardian. Um, you know, talking about 1890 to 19, 1910. Um, there were these dresses that were essentially lace, you know, all lace and net and just, you know, clingy to the body, but you were wearing this really insane corset underneath that had this very defined uh, Grecian S bend. Uh, they call it the S bend or the Grecian silhouette corset. Um, is, is this yeah. your stereotypical narrow waist hourglass kind of thing? Yeah, very much. And, and these dresses just, look as though they're painted on over that. And I've looked at a few in, in real life. I've studied a few and I just, I can't even imagine the the mathematics actually that goes into these things. Um, and I, I'm terrible at math. And so anything that requires, <laughs> anything that requires a, you know, calculation that based on geometry or I don't know, the position of the sun and the moon at any given time, <laughs> it doesn't, it, I, I can't do it. Um, so I get this, I get this feeling of like, wow, if only I could, and you know, I probably could if I if I really wanted to, I could sit down and I could I could perfect that skill that or skills that it takes to make those uh, dresses. But they're really, you know, my my real passion is is really that sixteen or fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred um, that three hundred year span uh, because I think clothing does the most interesting things during the, that period of time for men and women. <laughs> well, a light over that real quick because I, you know when I think of the the, the Victorian prime territory for historical costumery and i can think of any basically masterpiece theater you know hercule perot kind of uh, mystery and even though it's not technically quite an area it's it's close enough that i would think that there would be people who specialize in making these things for these shows oh yeah absolutely um i was actually i was actually doing a bit of research on um houdini the history channel's um houdini series two-part series came out last year with adrian brody and one of the interesting things about that period of time, it takes place in the probably, I think it starts in like the seven or 18, 18, late 1880s when he's a child and then goes all the way to nine, the, the late 19 or mid 1920s when he dies. And, uh, and one of the things about that period of time is that we have such a wealth of extant pieces and guides on how to make, we have patterns, we have all sorts of things that tell you exactly in the my, you know, tiniest detail how to reproduce these clothing. Um, and, and a lot of times history, uh, or these, these, um, you know, historical movies kind of just say, eh, you know, whatever, it's close enough and toss it out. Put so it in a, a corset and a bonnet. It'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. You know, it doesn't matter if it's like a, a 1850s bonnet and it takes place in 1910. No, one's going to notice, but you know, I notice and my, my group of friends notice. So yeah, I was, I was watching Houdini recently to, to kind of keep an eye on, on what was being done in there. And, and I think they were using a lot of extant, extant clothes, actually. So that's a real, really lucky thing about um, that period of time is when you're, when you're talking about um, what did they wear back then, we still have a lot of it and a lot of it's still wearable. So you see, you do see Hollywood movies that take place in that period reusing or, or using extant pieces, vintage pieces from that period. Which yeah, I so I mean, it sounds like it sounds like the 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 Houdini miniseries was getting it right, and I suppose yeah. at, at this point would be a good time to to reveal, yeah. like we did not at the beginning of this, that <laughs> you were actually uh, one of the co-hosts of another podcast called Frock Flicks. Exactly. Yes. Which, yeah. Uh, which go ahead and yeah. introduce that, and then we'll move on. No worries. Uh, Frock Flicks is the costume uh, costume movie podcast, and we look at historical costuming movies, and we basically critique them, sometimes not so nicely. <laughs> we, we can be a bit scathing in our, in our reviews on how history, in particular costume history, but also broader, you know, the broader uh, overall 
history, it just gets tossed out um, oftentimes because it's supposedly too complicated for modern audiences to understand or it's not interesting or sexy enough in ways that modern audiences will relate to. Yeah, and I, mean, I, I, I can almost kind of relate to that, you know, to the idea yeah. that it, it's one thing to adhere completely to the style of the time. But I think one of the problems might be is that if people have a particular idea already, what's it, uh, already of what people are wearing at that time, that to do something else to be actually authentic as opposed to faux authentic might throw people out of the story. Right. And I understand. And I, as, as the podcast has grown and we've also got our blog um, on frockflicks.com. And, uh, and as the blog has actually taken off, uh, we started it almost exactly a year ago, um, and it, it has reached heights that we did never expected it to. Um, and, and as a consequence, it's also reached audiences we never expected to. We're getting a lot of commentary, actual commentary from Hollywood costumers that come to the site and see that we've critiqued one of their films, and then they, they either understand what... Um, what we're trying to do and can sympathize because there's a whole lot of things that that don't even involve decisions that don't involve the costumer. Um, it, it's usually the producer or the director or the screenwriter or anybody else but the costumer. The costumer just is making whatever she's, she or he is told to make with that aligns with the vision that the director has of the show. So we get we do get some costumers that will understand that we're not attacking them that it's really a, a critique on the powers that be for them dumbing things down or nobody's going to care if, if, you know, you're wearing the wrong hat, you know, that's 200 years too late uh, or 200 years too early for whatever period you're in. And then we also get some costumers who, who think that it is a personal attack. Um, we've, we've had a run-in, a, a really, really uh, big run-in with a very popular um, TV show that's currently on uh, Stars right now. That's Outlander. Um, yeah. So the costumer for Outlander did not take kindly to <laughs> to our critique of the version of history. And it, it's funny because actually Outlander has a pretty solid grasp on the history itself. Other than the fact that it's a complete fantasy story, you know, this girl goes back in time from the 1940s to the 1740s and disregard all that, they actually do the historical part of Scotland, the Highlands in Scotland in the 1740s pretty darn well. So it's not, there. it was this interesting moment of trying to explain to, to this costumer that it's not, we're not critiquing necessarily that or we don't, we don't hate the show. We think the show is really good, but there's things you're putting out there because she had a blog that she made this big long post about that was all filled with horrible, <laughs> you know, just really off the wall um, assertions uh, of what historical accuracy was with clothing. And, and it wasn't just us, it was a huge uprising from the historical costuming community came out of the woodwork and basically read her the riot act for that. Um, and she settled on us because we're probably the more high profile people. Uh, so, but learning, we, we patched it up with them, uh, with her and, and, you know, because we're not here to make enemies but we're also here not to like coddle people's ego. You know, that's, that's really the hard part about what we do is now that we're, now that we're getting a bigger platform and more and more people from out there are coming in, there's more risk of running into the powers that be and, and butting heads with them directly, which I, I wait for the day when I get, you know, a, a message from on the blog from like a director, you know, some show like Rain or something like that. I, I would love to talk to that person and ask them what the hell they're doing. Well, <laughs> but, I mean, they might ask you the same thing as well, because I think part of the question here that that's underlying all this is the, the question of like, well, I mean, why is it so important to get these things right? Uh -huh. Yes. And and interestingly enough, when uh, Houdini, uh, the, uh, the screenwriter for Houdini, um, Nicholas Meyer, he wrote this op ed for the L.A. Times um, a couple of years ago about why we shouldn't or, or People who are interested in historical accuracy should not critique the uh, the Hollywood movie industry for what is essentially an art form. What's essentially an art form that we should just understand that it's it's a it's an artistic expression that they're not in the business of teaching people now. And he even goes on and he even admits that people get their history from mass media. 
like people understand or think they understand history based on what's in the media around them. And he uses the example of Shakespeare's Richard III, which I thought was a really interesting thing to say, because there have been centuries worth of scholarship attacking Shakespeare's version of Richard III as being wildly inaccurate. So, you know, Shakespeare <laughs> I mean, thought, Shakespeare thought there was like a shore in Bohemia or something like that, that yeah, it was on the, yeah, so yeah. not renowned for his historical accuracy to begin with. And, and again, uh, Meyer actually does uh, acknowledge, too, that the reason why people are, and this is actually our, our fundamental argument with frock flicks, is that people consume the media and they have such weak, especially in America, have such bad schooling, um, bad education system, that really these things aren't being addressed in the classroom uh, in any meaningful way. So they're going and they're, they're seeing the movie they're seeing, uh, you know, Mary Queen of Scots, who has black hair instead of red hair, who's this, you know, cute little thing running around in in uh, Mark Jacobs or no, not Mark Jacobs, or you know, Balenciagas, <laughs> basically these these couture gowns that are not 16th century gowns, and she's they they've, they've made her marry Francis, but he doesn't die or whatever it is, you know. There's there's these huge gaps in that story that they just meant they mess with the, the narrative the, the essential narrative of, of that subject's life in such a way that is ridiculous because Marie, uh, mary queen of scots had a wildly fantastic life you know that if you read that read about that life you, you know hollywood couldn't come up with the crazy stuff that goes on in it uh same thing with like henry the eighth you know why do we have the tutors where it's just it's a free-for-all orgy you know when really what we're talking about is a period of time where a, a king has six wives, like goes through six wives. He actually even tries to get permission to marry, you know, two women at once. You know, it's like, this is crazy. And nobody would believe that, but that's the history. And yet we have Jonathan Reese Myers, you know, writhing around with various different women. And I, I, I don't understand why, why Hollywood or, or mass media cannot take responsibility in, in being a format that also teaches, not just entertains. Why can't it be both? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I guess not to get you off, but I, I kind of, during this entire time, I'm kind of thinking of my own personal hobby horse, which is the uh, the Mel Gibson movie Apocalypto, which, you know, because uh, my my particular focus in history in Mesoamerica does not get partic de depicted very often or very well. Um, and particularly in that movie, they hired someone, uh, their, their set, their, you know, academic advisor essentially was someone who was, uh, conversant and an expert in this, uh, not to bore anyone, but the classical style of the Guatemala Highlands. And oh. then uh, Mel was trying to portray the uh, lowland post-class uh, Yucatec style. So that's like saying like it was several centuries apart and several hundred miles apart. And they were right. just like, eh, it's fine. Just put it all together. Yeah. And But when you look at it, it's like, oh, this is this is really jarring. And it's used in such a way that to portray some, some from pretty... Um, kind of uh, stereotypical and not particularly flattering ideas about the past that are kind of, I guess you could say, othering or colonialistic in a way. Yeah. But uh, I can imagine that being the same when you're dealing with, you know, not even with this extra layer of, you know, colonialism, but also just dealing with just basic past people telling their own stories where it says, if you were to if you were to take this story and these costume designs and the set design and everything and portray it as some story unrooted from reality, you know, portray it, oh, you know, people on a different planet or something like that, that'd be fine. But since you're portraying it like history, that has ramifications. Right. And, and I think that responsibility has to be taken for that on the part of, and I, I can, I use the word Hollywood to really mean any form, anybody who's, who's producing um, TV shows, movies, web series, is anything that's going out there in a mass media sort of way. Like, why can't we, why can't they feel some sort of responsibility for getting things right? Why does it have to be, well, this is just my vision, you know, stay away from my vision. <laughs> that doesn't make it okay to be egregiously inaccurate, um, especially when it, it's major plot points like Lincoln, you know, there were major plot points that, that happened in the movie that just, you know, you read any simple lightweight fluff reading about Lincoln, you would tell, you would know is wrong. Um, and, and then again, I also want to go back to Mel Gibson. Anything done by Mel Gibson, just, <laughs> he's he's um, he's pretty much just the guy who goes out there and he, he plays Mel Gibson. He's and, he's the anti-history. Yeah, <laughs> he wants to make everything really really 
good looking for himself, you know? Yeah. But I mean, I, there's, there's a difference between say having like a, a vision, say I'm thinking of right now of like Julie Taymor's Titus, uh, Titus Andronicus, <laughs> which is very stylized. You know, you have people driving around in cars and it's like this kind of faux uh, Weimar Republic Germany kind of going on, which is saying like, look, we know this is supposed to be set in, you know, uh, you know, Roman, you know, Roman uh, imperial times. But, you know, I have a vision and I'm so I have no need to actually adhere to this historical basis because I'm doing something clearly removed from that. And the difference between, say, doing that and trying to adhere very precisely to the actual historical, you know, modes of fashion at the time and just failing. Yeah, and actually it's interesting you mentioned Titus Andronicus because it's it's one of those things where and they do this a lot with Shakespeare obviously. Everyone's familiar with the uh you know, the modernization of Shakespeare for modern times or modern uh and, and honestly Shakespeare was writing his own his own works for modern times, his modern time. He wasn't really trying again to be a history teacher. He he did include a lot of history. I mean, it was teaching in a little in a sense, but it was it was his own version of it. So uh, the, the interesting part about Titus Andronicus with the uh, the Weimar Republic is that everything I've seen, I haven't actually watched the film, but everything that I've seen of it, they get the look pretty darn right. Like they look really that's Weimar Republic, you know, right there. Um, but it's of course not authentic to Shakespeare. It's not authentic to Titus Andronicus. It's it's really, you know, you, there's I guess I what, I what I'm really trying to get at is is there's a point where you have to pick your battles. Like, are you going to look at and get upset because it's not adhering to to Shakespeare the way it would have been played in Shakespeare's time, or are you going to be upset because it's not set in Imperial Rome? Or are you going to be overjoyed by the fact that they got the Weimar Repo Republic so well? You know. <laughs> So uh, it is It is such an interesting rabbit hole to get into because you just, you find all these other little things that, that you, you look at and you make an excuse for. Well, that's okay because it really, and, and I'm talking you as the audience, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the audience that's in the know. Well, sometimes, at, and maybe I'm just talking about myself, I'll watch a movie, a historical movie, and I'll say, well, okay, they didn't really get it that right, but they got within 10 years. So, okay, you know, I'll let that pass. I was actually thinking of Wolf Hall, uh, which was phenomenal because it, an interesting thing about Wolf Hall is, of course, it's a work of fiction. It's fictionalized history, which is hugely entertaining. And I, Hilary Mantel is, is an incredible writer. Um, and the way that it was brought to the screen was just outstanding. Is it historically accurate in the history of, of uh, you know, Cromwell's life? Meh, here and there, you know, they, there's some things that get left out. There's some things that they change. Uh, but if you're talking about the clothing, it's it's pretty damn close. I mean, they, they really don't skimp on the research and the clothing part of things. But then I've also heard from people who are, uh, you know, know a lot about interior design history and <laughs> they're up in arms because all the interiors are 17th and 18th century. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you're really picking your battles, focused, indeed. Yeah, everyone's focused on their one little, you know, thing that they, their pet peeve. Um, and we just happen to focus on costume and then also kind of the larger historical background in, in the movies that we, we enjoy watching or the time periods that we're interested in. So, yeah. yeah. Well, sir, I mean, it's been lovely talking to you. Do you have any, some kind of concluding remarks you'd like to leave us with? Hmm. Be excellent to each other and party on to. <laughs> no, I, I really don't. I just think that I that that this was a great opportunity, and thank you so much for reaching out. This was this was a ton of fun, and and I enjoyed it. And I hope it was as fun for you as it was for Sarah and I. I'd like to thank her for being such an incredible guest. Uh, and, of course, I'd like to thank you, the listener, for being the listener. Uh, you were the reason we do this podcast to both entertain and educate you. Uh, if you'd like some more of that edutainment, uh, although we don't, please don't ever call us that, uh, you can head over to frockflix.com and check out the, that's the site that she does with a, a few of her co-conspirators in fashion history. Uh, about reviewing kind of uh, media and things and basically the ways they, they get wrong and some things they get right. So uh, it's a fascinating website. I can see why it's getting a little more attention as the time goes by. We will also, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, our previous guest, Chocolate Pot, will be doing a Ask Me Anything on the Ask Historians subreddit on September 28th. That's uh, this coming this coming Monday, this is uh, Friday the 25th, this will be coming out? Yes. Uh, so if you're listening to this and it's... Uh, before the 28th, 
uh, mark it on your calendar and come by and think of some questions about 19th century fashion. As for the episode, I hope it made sense, all my little rambling at the beginning about how you really have to look at uh, fashion not simply as just this kind of set decoration, but as an integral part of the history of a story that you're telling and the history of the people that are experiencing that story. So I hope that managed to gel all together at, at the end. Uh, we'll be doing a slightly less abstract topic on the next, uh, uh, well, I guess you can't really call clothing abstract. Although we did touch that are kind of more abstract when discussing kind of history and fashion. Uh, next Fortnite topic, next episode, will be uh, both literally more concrete and more explosive as we look at, oh, I will be speaking to Von Adler about the French plan for World War II. Uh, basically, not uh, we, we had a previous episode that focused on kind of the Battle of France. Uh, in this, we're going to be kind of looking at how the French really thought that would go and focusing no more in on that. So I hope you come back and join us then. Uh, until then, feel free to uh, share this with every single person you meet on the street. Uh, please just, you know, hand him, a, hand him a thumb drive with this on it, uh, with all the episodes on it. And or you're, you find someone and offer to give them a tattoo with the Ask Historians podcast logo. Why not? It's friendly. So until then, uh, if you don't want to do that, you can also just rate and review us on iTunes or whatever streaming service you use. Uh, until then, we'll see you in two weeks. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at AskHistorians, and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.